Can't you make water, bro? You're a wizard. God, make yourself useful. Hey guys, it's your girl Aisha, aka GeekXX Chic, and we are back with another reaction to The Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power. We're now on season two, episode two, which is called Where the Stars Are Strange. So last episode, we picked up basically from where season one ended. The three rings now have new owners, and we can already see that the influence that the ring has over their heads and hearts is happening. Elrond didn't look happy. He took off. And then with the wizard and Nori, they finally made their way to Kuhn, but we see that there is someone following them, probably the old man, and that there seems to be some sense of hesitation with him stepping into Kuhn because he says he believes he's been there before. And then with Sauron, he went back to Mordor, faced Adar, but of course Adar has no idea who he is. And he made a deal with him to basically say he was going to hunt himself down in exchange for basically Adar sending them the armies anywhere he told them to. So really Sauron has his plan that he always had it's being put into action it's just being put in a different way now that he realizes that Adar is the key to the orcs so that's where we left things I'm excited to jump into this episode just before I do the reminder if you'd like to be in the know of when I drop episodes please go ahead hit that subscribe button as well as the notification bell so that you can be in the know all right that out of the way guys let's get into the episode right now I absolutely love the way the Dwarven City looks guys even last season I thought the design was so cool Almost makes me want to live underground. Almost. I also noticed that they're much more ethnic in the Dwarven Kingdom. You're married a prince. Now you're bound to an outcast. I don't think she cares. And I wouldn't trade his heart for a mind full of okay. fire. Okay. That's poetry. <laughs> and. And your heart. Both. Uh-oh. Uh oh. Brace yourself. Damn, okay, she said now, y'all. Damn, she got good ears. Damn, some people just died. The bridge just went, got taken out, y'all. What the hell? Oh, the fact that he protected her. It's a real man right there. Does that normally occur? Or is that because of the mining they weren't supposed to be doing? Why are they closing all the windows? No, 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 no. Yeah, underground, that's terrifying. Very terrifying. I don't like it at all. I'm not even claustrophobic, but that would trigger me going into a claustrophobic episode. <laughs> what news? I've had an unexpected visitor. Yeah, it has to already. Where, why did all the light go away? What the hell happened? Well, that's disconcerting. Are they not the seeds you planted? Oh, she's dreaming. Damn! That's what you get for making demon rings. Oh wow, that was fast. Wakey wake. We may be able to crush two spiders with one boot. And what says the commander of the Northern um, Army? Too busy daydreaming about our death. He seeks to rule it not only through conquest, by bending the minds and wills of all its people exactly. to his own. And for that, he needs not armies. Allies. And he cannot craft them mm -hmm. without Celebrim. Sauron is alone. Is he? A region is protected by two Always peoples. underestimating. Celebrimbor and the secrets of his craft <laughs> are safe. Oh, my king. Didn't last season, didn't you get into a near, we have to leave Middle Earth situation because you underestimated Galadriel's words? Okay. Glad to know you learned from that. Sauron's plan is in motion. Mm hmm And even now, I know it. You believe the rings have kindled your ability to see that which has not yet come to pass. Is it so far-fetched? You have crystal balls that do the same thing. Once the deceiver obtains a being's trust, he gains the ability to sculpt That's their That's quite true. I mean, look how long it took you to tell them the truth. Alter the very reality. You have already. So is Calibrimbor. And I know his. Which is why I must face him. <sighs> Let her go. Let her go. How brand was not so wrong. There you go. Exactly. The fact that you're still trying to humanize him is the problem. I was not alone. 
Who's going with you? Please don't drag Elrond into this. Ooh, pretty. I'm loving the cloaks and the design of the costumes this season. I want so bad. But he wishes you good fortune on your journey. Are you asking me to leave? Are you not smart enough to pick that up? Don't feel sorry for him. I believe he's injured, my lord. Not our problem. Let him be. Exactly. He'll heal. Messengers from Lindon should arrive with news any day. It's too late. This one's fallen in love with him. Damn, the women are weak in this show. <laughs> weak in the knees! Ah, messengers never made it. He killed them on the way. Thank God Galadriel's on her way. This mask is honestly badass. I'm not gonna lie. It's, it's pretty cool. I want, oh, the horse kind of has his own version. Is this cult? It's very judgy of me, just assuming that every potential religious group is a cult. Thank you for the moths in my face, ma'am. <gasps> why, why, why is it should be cut? I said commune, I guess it's actually more of a summon. Sweet, that was well done. Budget, baby. Hello, moth queen. Perhaps the blood I wasted to bring you before me should have been spent on more useful servants. Blah, blah. A mortal like yourself could it's defeat human. an E-star when my most powerful acolytes. Ooh, shade. Because if he doesn't, I will slaughter the halflings exactly. he friends. You underestimate the halflings. Everyone always does. It is a fine name. Nevertheless, it is not going to be mine. I know. Fredegar. <laughs> Fred! I like it. Hey, Freddy. No one can give you a name. Uh, your parents do all the time. It is huh? who you are. Huh? You'll hear us one day. I'm sure of it. But in the meantime, we keep giving you pet names. Because it's fun. And we're bored. Over there, come on! Thank God for Poppy. She's quite the little navigator. God knows where we'd be without her. Still spinning in circles. That's really open. But then again, I think everywhere you've been traveling is pretty open. She would run out of water the first day and die of heat. The <laughs> so pessimistic. Can't you make water, bro? You're a wizard. Useless. I really like the poet, the, the poetic way they talk in this show, like the talk about the name. It's very true that like once you have your name, like I couldn't imagine changing my name, even though like I don't dislike my name, but at this point I just feel like I would feel so weird because it's my name is now my name, you know? Let me just, I know magic small. Period! God, make yourself useful. So what's this curse of the flesh? If the Ishtar can fix that, then maybe they'll leave him alone. They're still close. Mount up. Thank God for that Harfoot hiding. They are watching our trail, meaning we'd be wise to find another. Guess you're cutting across the desert, although you'll be we wide open. Have. Yep. I feel them though. It's the dehydration that's the problem. The heat you can deal with, but when the dehydration starts to kick in, some say the mountain was cursed when the prince let in that elf. Of you course. two wouldn't be trafficking in conjecture, would you? Exactly. Zip it. With your approval, sire, we will find the light. You have it. Period. Get things. Uh oh. oh. I thought that was another rumble. If anyone can do it, it's, D it's Disa. I trust her. I prefer this to the elven singing. I'm gonna be 100 with you. The stone singers have fostered our sacred connection to this rock. And? Not once have they ever ceased to provide for us. That's not their fault, bro. Dark magic's afoot. The hand of darkness is closed on Ankhazar Doom. Think carefully, Delvasta. I mean, he did agree to try it your way first. Are you really going to make me ask? I mean, I should. Surely Durin knows I spoke. 
spoke in anger. If that's an apology I hear, King, try saying it to my husband. Why should it be me who apologizes? Oh God, they are two the same person. He is stubborn as a root bound parsnip. Just like his daddy. One more quality the two of you have in common. Yeah. No wonder we can't hear the mountain. It's King is deaf to the sorrow of his own son. You want to show true strength. Humble yourself. Summoned your son to you. Period. She spoke truth, bro. People think that humility, showing humility takes weakness. It takes so much strength not to sit in your pride. Been polishing jewels all his life. <laughs> uh, if you can't take a little rizzing, you'll be fine. Lay a finger on me again. I'll bite it off at the knuckle. <laughs> Respect me. That's right. Prince or no. Personal space. Okay. Yeah, it sucks. They're just jealous of you. This rye tastes like last year's bread. It is last year's bread. <laughs> Damn. Uh, climb off your high peak and apologize. <laughs> Poor Disa. This sucks. I'm afraid, Durin. I'm afraid. Damn. Come here. Make it right. Immediately. You'll find a way. We always have. It's wonderful. How? Exactly. Let's get to the plan. Pretty words. Don't help when you need action. Of course, I knew this chick was going to show up. Leave Elrond alone. I'm asking you to join us. That's a hard no. But if I were to face the enemy alone, I may be vulnerable to deception. And why would he think that? You stupid Elrond. No, I think you need to say it out loud. And under his hand, I was played like a harp to a melody not of my choosing. It was entirely of your choosing. It was. Sauron looked inside you. And saw. the very song of your soul. No Period. Body. Exactly. You're putting it all on him, sis. Mm -hmm. You gave him everything he wanted and then thanked him for it. And now he has done the same to Gilgal and to every elf in Lindor. Mm -hmm. He may well want you in a regular. Please, Elrond. Out of my face. I cannot let him in again. That's up to you. He never left Galadriel. Ooh! In choosing to wear those rings. I love him. You have all chosen to become his collaborators. Ooh, let her know. I will have no part in it. Stand your ground. Please leave. Can't always get what you want, Galadriel. He will end up there. I know. But I like that you made her work for it. Good for you, Elrond. She tried every manipulation trick she had in her book, right down to the tears. Would you cast Romil's verses into the flame because the poet was a drunkard? It's not the same. At all. At all. Someone taking a drink is much different than trying to kill the entire world. Judge the work and leave judgment concerning those who wrought it to the judge who sees all things. That feels impossible. It is hard. It is called humility. Is it? And it is difficult for most. I guess so, it's true. But also remember this man's wearing a ring and he refuses to take off, so. But look at the power they exert over every form of life. Yeah, that should scare you. This is why they must remain in the hands of elves. Not humans? Okay. For it is not your enemy that bears these rings, but your most trusted friend. Which is why it hurts so bad. But rather open your eyes and guide them before the darkness spreads across Middle Earth and blinds us all. But how can you guide those who do not want to be guided? But that was actually a really good speech. It really was. I will talk more about it in the review, but the idea of separating works from the person is very valid. Uh-oh. Good or bad? You need to rest. You're gonna die if you do. Okay. Well, I guess you're gonna rest. <laughs> but y'all really do need to get to water. How could someone who hasn't eaten in so long still wait so Dead weight is no joke, yo. It is no joke. But y'all is strong. That's right. Women always get it done, period. She's going as fast as she can. And hopefully that water is, like, drinkable. That's probably not a good thing. Poppy, go grab the damn rope! We're none of us going to lose each other. Hmm. Yeah, he just needed to have a little nap. That's all, guys. Crying that my eyes are too dry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. What did that bell just signal? 
And your pursuers are going to be very close now, too, because now they know. Does that, there's no way that wasn't heard across the entire valley. We were just having a drink of water. I don't think they want to talk. Y'all had to piss him off. Yes, that's a good time to lose control. Because the audacity of you shooting at children. Oh, shit. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. I was thinking you just give him a little, little pushback, a little shove. Oh, God, we're going to lose him. We're going to lose him. Get in the well. Get in the well. Why is it he's stopping it? He can't. Hold on, girls. There we go. He needs his motivation. Yeah, I think they are. Oh my god. Oh my god. Fix it. There's nothing but rock around if they land. Oh god, let them be okay. He tried to get to them, he did. It's gone. Has it? <laughs> I hate nerds when they do that. He's all like, mm -hmm. it's something. You guys can't figure it out, can you? Mm -hmm. The night is cold, my lord. Shall I bring him ashore? No! He's fine! Ah, <sighs> so annoying. But we do know that he gets another ring made, so... <laughs> the umbrella is great. Y'all weak in the knees. Galadriel? You have spoken with her? No, but Why he not figured out exactly of what happened. Well, then you know nothing of what's happened. <sighs> This is so sad because the way he just plays people. Have they worked? Thank God. Thank God. Thank God we have phones. The true creators toil till their knuckles bleed. And then they come along, take whatever profits them most, and forget all about us. Elrond describing exactly what happened with Galadriel and how easily he manipulates people. Where are you going? Wait, yeah. There's no cause to stay where I'm not wanted. Oh, but that's why you stayed out here for two days? Yeah, okay. God, you're pathetic. I actually, let me take that back. That's not fair. They're not perfect, despite what elves seem to think of themselves. They are proud. Are you my friend? No. Don't say it. Say no. Yes, of course. Damn. It's over. I did not come here to toast the elven rings. I'm afraid you're gonna have to kill Celebrimbor, guys. To make rings for men. Rings for men. Ew. Yuck, no. The risks of, of corruption are far greater. Exactly what he wants. I take it then you are not a king. No. Oh, he is in his mind. What are you? Evil incarnate. Albron. He said that's not his name. No, not the vino. Hardest loss we took this whole show. Foreshadowing much? In search of an artist possessing the craft to save all Middle Earth. Um, I'm gonna correct you there. It's enslave all Middle Earth. Yeah. And when our work is complete, I will kill you. The Lord of the Rings. Ooh, the drop. Not the Jesus backdrop. Damn, Sauron was good back in his day, gotta say. Gotta say, he mastered that. Where did he even get the outfit? Did you just whip that up? Stop it. Wow, Eddie changed his hair. <laughs> He's like, I really missed the bust down. <laughs> you need not bow to me. Yeah, don't. Our work begins now. Anatar. Anatar. Damn. The amount of time y'all spend just staring at this thing. Meanwhile, Kella Brimbor's up to no good. Thank you for reconsidering. I didn't. It is not I you ought to thank. Elrond, but not for you. I'm afraid you misunderstand Galadriel. He'll be leading it. Elrond's task is not to join your company, but to lead it. Hmm. Know your place. <laughs> now, on to business. Can't read that. It's for me, Daddy. 
invitation from Lord Celebrimbor. He wants the dwarves to come to Eregion. Yep, he wants Mithril. The pieces are all falling into place, y'all. Mm -mm. Mm. Whew, all right, guys, that was a fantastic episode. We are moving things right along with this plot. And I got to say, I like it. I know that uh, one of the big, one of the bigger, I should say, uh, critiques people had of season one is they felt like it moved too slowly and, you know, they weren't sure where the plot was going. But I feel like this season, they've done a really good job already of putting the pieces together, helping us see what Sauron's vision is and how he's putting it into place and how all these different pieces, these players, AKA the human, well, we haven't got the humans at this point, but the dwarves and the elves are all being played and put into their positions, even Adar, to get what it is that he wants, right? You can say a lot of things about Sauron. He was an evil SOB, but he was no dummy. He definitely had been thinking about this plan for a very long time, like centuries, right? <laughs> Seeing how it's, it's coming to light now is kind of crazy, but impressive, right? Like obviously knowing how this whole thing turns out, you know, you're kind of half rooting for his downfall, but you're also super intrigued by how well planned out and thought out and how intricate the whole thing is. And so yeah, watching it come about in front of us is really, really interesting. But I think the main things I thought was interesting in this episode or that stood out to me, I want to talk about the wizard and how they're, you know, they're trucking along, but things are going quite slow because every, where they are is very dry. There's not a lot of food or water. And basically they don't know like where they're going. They don't know the best way to go. Obviously having horses would be best, but not an option for them. And we see that uh, Poppy finds a road that will take them closer to where they need to go, but it's literally through the most barren of the desert. There's no water, there's no shelter, there is no food. And we see that right off the bat, the wizard's like, I don't know that we're gonna be able to make that journey without dehydrating. And at first they weren't gonna go, but then they discover that they're being followed. And so they're like, actually, we kind of have to switch because we're being followed. So they end up taking that path. And unfortunately we see that um, they do get hit by the dehydration and the heat exhaustion. And thank goodness though, Poppy with those keen eyes, as we know, hobbits have two things, keen eyesight and keen, um, keen hearing. And anyways, she sees the well and she manages to go to the well and get it because poor the poor wizard basically had heat stroke and she was just so desperate for it that she didn't realize there's a giant bell sitting above this this well for whoever uses it if they're not careful it sounds an alarm so again it was kind of frustrating to me that like poppy didn't go back to stop it but i get like i can only imagine being that thirsty like all you're gonna think about is getting the water in your system at that point you could care less about the noise but anyways, of course, it was a giant signal to where they were and they get caught up with by these riders who we discover in this episode are being, they've been hired by a dark sorcerer. We don't know who this dark sorcerer is at this point, just that he is in Kun and he wants Ishtar captured and brought to him. At this point, I don't think he wants him taken out, but he wants him brought to him. And he's like, I need him here before he learns how to use his powers. And we see that the people from last season that were dressed in the crazy white cloaks, they were also sent from him, it looks like. And we all know that they didn't manage to capture him, but he was basically like, okay, I brought you guys in. You weren't able to get him in. So I'm using these riders now. And he's like, are you sure you're gonna be able to bring them in? Because you know, my, what did he call them? White, white wings, I think is what he called them. He's like, I couldn't get them to capture him. So what makes me think that you guys can? And they said that they've got some kind of curse of their flesh that they want him to, I guess, use his magic to, cur to cure in exchange for them bringing in the mage. And they said that the way that they're gonna do is instead of fighting him directly, they're going to threaten the lives, the lives of the hobbits because they know that the hobbits mean something to him, particularly Nori. So that would probably work, honestly. I was like, oh, it saddens me because we, we've seen that the bond between Nori and this man has gotten very tight and he definitely would not want to see Nori hurt for him. But we also know that Nori is a lot more, she's a lot more resourceful than she looks. A lot of, like, again, I've said this throughout the episode that hobbits have been underestimated, right? Even in the Lord of the Rings movies, people underestimated hobbits just because they're small. But as they said, there there's a lot of things about them that make them very special. And Nori's no joke, right? We saw that last season. So anyway, these writers come up upon them and thankfully they, they showed their cards of not being friends very early and they 
they tried to attack but then we see that the poor mage tried to protect them and in the midst of it he conjures a cyclone but he can't control it much like anytime he uses his magic for the most part it goes crazy it goes nuts and so he conjures a cyclone which of course keeps them away but it also blows away the two hobbits who don't have enough body or body weight to keep them planted against such a huge storm so we see that he tried to grab them before they disappeared, but unfortunately he didn't get to them in time. So I'm praying they didn't get hurt because like I said, there's no soft surface nearby for them to land on. They got tossed pretty high. Uh, we know hobbits are hardy, but that 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 could hurt. So I'm really hoping they don't get hurt too badly because again, our uh, wizard friend is gonna feel absolutely devastated if they get hurt. He's already gonna probably be scared to use his powers again at this point too. But I don't think he thought about using them in that moment. He, he just really, he thought about protecting Nori and Poppy and I don't think he really cared about what happened next so anyway we'll have to find out next episode where those girls ended up and like I said hopefully they're not too hurt but yeah it's interesting to know that it's a dark wizard that's looking for the wizard um yeah it's a dark sorcerer yeah or dark wizard that's looking for our our I'm gonna call him good wizard at this point so why does he know who he is my guess is he knows who he is I think he does but yeah, we since last season, people have been looking for this man and I still wanna know like, where did he eject from? Why did he land where he did? Like so much of his story is still a giant question mark, but hopefully we'll get some more soon. So that was them. And then we had the dwarves and we see that things were going pretty chill there with the exception of course of Darren, right? It's Darren, who's the son. Um, him and his dad are still fighting since last season because of course they disagreed over Elrond and poor, bless her, poor Disa is doing her best to be a medium between these two stubborn idiots. And she knows that like, it's gonna take one of them finally just getting off their high horse and just, you know, humbling themselves to just say, okay, you know, whatever, I I'll concede so we can move forward. But yeah, they're both extremely stubborn. And it, you know, I think Disa put it best where she said like to his dad, like it's gonna have to be you. Like if we're being real, you're gonna have to be the one to, to concede first because my husband's not gonna do it. Like she said, you know, the mountains, uh, what she said, like the, the ice caps on the mountains are gonna, are gonna thaw before he's gonna let this go. So we'll see whether or not his dad actually comes around to say that, but it was very funny to watch her go between them. But then we see that there was a, earthquake that happened and it closed all of the sun shafts going into the city. And of course, with no sunlight, most of their crops cannot grow. And I got to imagine it's just hella depressing as well. <laughs> And so, yeah, it's causing them to have less food and they were already having a hard time growing crops when Elrond came. So yeah, it's things are getting very tight underneath there. And we see that uh, they tried to do all the things they normally do, the, so the stone singing to see if they could bring out more shafts, but it's not working. Like every, every opening they try to open, there's just more rock. So they're like, we're gonna have to see if we can dig our way out. But of course they're saying it's very dangerous because we know that from the mithril mining last season, there's a very unstable areas in that mountain that if you hit the wrong vein, it could bury the whole city. So yeah, it's it's scary business. And now we know that that's not entirely an accident that they're in that situation. But yes, that's where they're at. And then we see that um, Darren gets a summons from, from Celebrimbor, basically, because we know that they need mithril to make these rings. And the only mithril, or the biggest mithril source is their mountain. And we know last season that that's what Elrond was trying to get. Like, like a steady supply of mithril to the elven kingdoms in exchange for food and supplies. But we see that the king refused because of the elves and their bad blood. So now Darren's like, hey, if I can figure out a way to get us food, if our father, if my father's refusing to, then that's what I'm gonna do. But also this is definitely something that's going to, well, I was gonna say it, it appeals to Darren's pride as it should, because you know he feels very slighted since last season and his dad saying what he said, but also the people are starving, right? His people are starving, people are getting desperate, his own kids aren't eating the food. So yeah, he's he's in a place now where he's much more willing to negotiate, even if it isn't the best thing for his people. So that's how we had things go down under the ground. And then finally you had with the elves that Galadriel is getting visions of what will happen. She's already envisioned that Sauron made his way back to Celebrimbor. And she's like, we need to go there because we haven't heard back from him to say that he knows about Sauron. So maybe we should go and check. 
The king was like, I don't think we need to worry about that. But thankfully, Galadriel has a sixth sense when it comes to Sauron. And she said, yeah, like I'm telling you, he's going to want to make more rings and he needs Celebrimbor. He doesn't have the skill set to do it on his own. He needs Celebrimbor. So he's going to go back to him. So we need to go there and stop him from doing anything. And so the king said, I'm okay, like fine if you can go. But my issue is that you're already under Sauron's influence. And I can't trust that you're not going to be, basically that he's not going to use his abilities and use his magic to take over you again. And of course she is, you know, ah, oh, it's not the case. And he's like, mm, I think so. Like even the fact that she called him How um, Hallbrand instead of Sauron, right? That was a very clear indicator that she still has emotional connections to who she thought Sauron was. And so he's like, yeah, no, I don't think, I think if you go by yourself, he will definitely manipulate you again. So he's like, if you bring a party with you, then fine, but just not alone. So she goes to Elrond. Um, apparently she, I, I thought she made that part up about having to go there, but I'm starting to think the king did. <laughs> insist that Elrond be part of the par party. Um, but she goes back to Elrond who is, you know, he's left uh, the king's area and he's gone back to, um, you know, his, his master there uh, doing his woodwork because he just, you know, he's trying to work some stuff out. And anyways, I love that whole interaction just because again, my biggest issue with Galadriel is that she's very prideful. Like she's not dumb. She's very smart. She's very intuitive. She was not wrong about Sauron. She was right to follow her gut. However, she has this pride about her that is very grating. And the fact that she never really feels like she can admit when she's wrong or take in other people's, she doesn't like to take in anyone else's counsel if it's not what she wants to hear. And so anyways, I really like that Elrond very much knows her tea. And he just was like, yeah, girl, go ahead and ask me until you're blue in the face. I don't want to go nowhere with you. I warned you about them rings. And now you're getting the, you know, side effects from the rings. Like I told you we needed to destroy them and you wanted to wear them. So what, what do you want from me? And of course she's like, oh, but I need your help. And you know, I can't let him back in, like come with me. And he said, he's never left. What do you mean let him back in? He's still in your heart. He's still in your mind. That's why you're wearing those rings. You're still, he's like, this is his game. He gave Celebrimbor the idea for the rings. So like, even if he didn't directly taint these rings, there's no way he would have given Celebrimbor that information if there wasn't a larger plan. And y'all are literally playing his game right now. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. So anyways, he basically says, I'm not going. Like, it's not my problem. You deal with it. So I was really proud of him for doing that. Cause like I said, Galadriel needs a bit of a, she needs a reality check from time to time. We saw that a lot last season. So anyway, she leaves at that point and then he goes to talk to his master because he's just like you know it's it's bothering him because even though he like i said rightfully told her to take a walk his you know he that, that's still his friend he still does care about her and he is still also curious. Like, I think he also knows that Galadriel's uh, fears are not completely unfounded. So he goes to talk to his master about it. And his master, who of course is also a ring bear, you know, he's like, how do you, he's like, I don't know how to do, I can't separate these rings, you know, from who created them or who was part of creating them. Like I just, he's like, to me, they're not beautiful. They're a sign of, of taint. They're a sign of evil. And there's some really interesting conversation pieces brought up by his master. And I said in the episode, I didn't want to get too much into it, but the way he basically said, you know, judge the work on its own and then leave the judging of the creator for the person who's, you know, who sees all, aka a God, right? And it's a very religious type of saying, but very realistic, right? And I just think that it's just a, it's a really good conversation because like in our, if we were to apply it to our real world situation, you know, he brought about, like he said, oh, what about this particular poet? He's like, would you burn all of his poems when you find out that he was an alcoholic? And he's like, what? He's like, and then he noticed, he's like, oh, there's another singer. He's like, he was a terrible person in real life, but his voice was angelic, right? So him bringing about the fact that people, there are people in this world and I'm, we've experienced it ourselves. I think all of us have experienced it where whether it's a singer or an artist or a writer or whatever the case may be, that there are some people who can create beautiful things, beautiful things, whether they're, you know, whether it's jewelry, clothing, music, architecture, you know, paintings, like there are people who can create beautiful things. People who have such an amazing talent to do certain things who might have some very dark sides to them right? They might have addiction issues. They might be abusive. They might have led a very, what we would consider to be a very bad life or made a lot of bad choices in their life. And then the question then becomes like, does everything that they created become tainted and evil and bad because they did things that were tainted and evil and bad, right? That's, that's, that's a very 
interesting moral debate. And I think, I don't think there's a right answer to be fair. Like I know people who, if a certain, they're fused, if they're, a musician that they listen to, they find out that they do, that they've done horrible things. They no longer can listen to the music because they just don't feel right about listening to it or listening to it brings up a lot of negative emotions. So they don't enjoy it anymore. So they won't support that artist or, or um, they won't listen to that music anymore. Whereas other people will be like, well, that's the song. Like the, the song is one thing. Like just because I like the song doesn't mean that I approve of what they're doing, right? So there's, as I said, I don't think there's a right or a wrong. I think it always comes down to what you as a person can, can, uh, sit with with your conscience but I just thought it was a really good very good conversation piece and a very good thinking piece that the master brought up for for Elrond to consider and then he also which I think was the part that was really the bar in this one where he says you know if you think your friends are walking down the wrong path um then he's like you shouldn't just abandon them like if you're really a friend you don't just walk away you should be staying beside them and seeing what you can do to help them see the light and come back to the proper path before there's more suffering, right? So that was really the main thing. And obviously that's the the part that got Elrond to reconsider going on this, this mission is that it was pride that was keeping him from accompanying Galadriel. Cause as I said, he knows that what Galadriel's saying is valid and that her fears are very valid, but his pride about being right about the rings is why he didn't want to, and also to punish her a little bit. It, it's that's what's keeping him from making this very much needed trip to Celebrimbor and trying to warn him and stop him from going forward with this, you know, going forward with making these rings. So anyway, um, I just thought that was a really good, uh, out of the episode, that's my lesson around, you know, the right way to handle a situation where people that you love or care about might be walking down a path that you don't agree with. But if you do think there's any way to help them see a better path, it's better for you to stick by them and try to influence them versus go against them directly and, you know, basically hope that they you know, miss you enough at some point <laughs> to come around to your point of view, if that makes sense. So anyways, really good conversation there. Really good writing as well, I have to say. And then finally, what we had was Sauron, right? Sauron, we saw last episode showed up to where Celebrimbor was. Celebrimbor refused him initially, but he stayed there. Oh, and actually one thing I want to bring out was also um, Elrond, when he was talking to, to Galadriel, he was talking about how, because she tried to say that, oh, everything that happened with her being deceived was all Sauron, you know, and that she was just led down something she didn't mean to do. And he said, no, he's like, you meant to do all of it. And then he basically called her out by saying, he's like, he looked inside of you and he saw what you were looking for. And then he played every note to a T because you were looking for a savior. You were looking for a king of the South to rise, prove that you were right, ride up and just make you help elevate you to all the L's to prove that you were, you know, wh whoever you thought you were supposed to be to the L's. He didn't make you do anything you didn't want to do, right? And that was so true because that's what Sauron does. Sauron looks into the heart of what you want. He looks at you know, your weaknesses, so to speak, and he exploits them. And in Galadriel's case, as I said, that pride of hers, right? That need for recognition, that need for approval. He saw those things and he became at first the, oh, the lowly king that doesn't want the responsibility who she had to foster and bring along and encourage. And then the man who might take the steps that she wanted to grow into what, you know, he's supposed to be, right? Like he just literally, he pulled from Galadriel what she wanted and then he just played the part. But like Elrond said, if you hadn't wanted to do those things, you wouldn't have. If it, if it had gone against your nature, you would have felt something wrong much sooner. But he found out what you needed and he just found out the way to manipulate that for his will. And so brilliantly said, because that's exactly what Sauron does. And then we see that happen with him and Calabrimbor when he gets there, because we see that Calabrimbor won't see him initially, but you know, hi, Sauron's immortal. He's like, I got time. I'll just stay here because I know that the kind of man that Calabrimbor is, he's not going to let me stay out here indefinitely he will see me at some point and that's what ends up happening and of course you know he we see that he killed the messengers he got to the messengers before they got to Celebrimbor so he killed them and took their message so of course he doesn't know I was asking last episode if he got the message or not he didn't so he used that as his opening to be like oh you mean they didn't send you word yet they didn't tell you anything you mean you're outside the loop? You mean they don't see you and appreciate you, right? Because obviously from when he worked with Celebrimbor before, he already knows that Celebrimbor seeks out, I wouldn't say validation so much as appreciation for his work. Like, I mean, obviously we know in the Elven community from last season that they do know that he's a very masterful worker, but I don't think they understand or in his opinion, I don't think they, they recognize just how much 
work and thought and so much of his like creativity that he pours into all of his works. Like I think they just kind of like, oh yeah, his stuff is beautiful. Yeah, his stuff is nice, but they don't really like see how for, for Kella Brimbor, life-changing these things are. And so Sauron saw that and he just jumped right in that insecurity and absolutely exploited it. Like, oh man, like artists like us, you know, we're just always overlooked, right? Where no one sees how hard we work. They don't think that we're important enough to keep in the loop, right? And it's sadly, it worked, of course, because Calibrimbor, that is something that he deals, that he is dealing with, that, that, I guess, fear of under underappreciation, or maybe he already always felt that he was underappreciated. Either way, Sauron saw that, jumped right in and played those notes to a T. And of course, after that, after he waited for like two, three days in the rain, suddenly he's like, oh, I'm gonna leave because if I'm not wanted here, I don't want to stay. And of course, by that point, Caliburn was like, no, wait, I, you, please tell me if the rings worked, come have food, get warm. Played, played like a violin, but anyway, so, we see that once Sauron plays those right notes and manages to get in, he tells Celebrimbor about the rings. And, you know, understandably, Celebrimbor is very emotional. Like it's, this is his life's work, right? This, or not his life's work, but this is like the greatest work of his life to this point. And he really just wanted to know if he had been capable of doing something like that. So of course that makes him emotional. Yes, I do think it was somewhat because he's happy he saved the elves, but also because he's so proud that he was able to do this thing in his craft that is so above anything he's ever done before. So anyways, um, from that point, he, you know, Sauron knows he's got him fairly pliable. And so he basically lets him know that his objective of being there is that he wants more rings, but this time for men. And we see that first Celebrimbor is like, nah, like, first of all, men, ew, <laughs> don't like humans. But also he's like, nah, like, I don't really want to make rings anymore. Like, I just did that one thing because it was A, for a good cause, but also because I wanted to see if I could. But now that I know it's not that deep, but we see that at that point, uh, Sauron's like, all right, I gotta find a way to put a fire under this guy because he's he, he isn't going to be motivated to do this because elves are very vain and they do think themselves better than the other races so his, this is where Celebrimbor's snobbery would have won out so instead he he goes and once again we hear the way Sauron kind of asks the right questions and just plants things here and there to figure out like what it is that motivates people is masterful and he manages to figure out that for Celebrimbor if he felt like he was doing something for a higher purpose like he was being called to something greater with his work, that would be the fire he needs to do what he needs to do and not be distracted. Because this is the main thing. Sauron needed something to keep Celebrimbor on task, even when he, because he knows inevitably that Galadriel and the High King were going to get to him. But he needed to get Celebrimbor reined in before that happened. And he managed to do it, right? Once he figured out that Celebrimbor had that, you know, kind of grandiose vision of what he thinks he's supposed to do, he jumped right in and exploited that. He's like, okay, if that's what you need, then I will give you a grandiose mission. So we see that he uses his abilities to shapeshift and makes himself look like he's a high elven lord or high elven god, and that he's commissioned from above to come down and ask Celebrimbor to do this thing, that to just do this little thing for the greater good of the elven kind. And of course, Celebrimbor now thinks that this is a deep celestial message or celestial mission. So he's locked in now. The sad reality is that he is now locked in and he now wants to do whatever he has to do to kind of fulfill this mission that in his opinion is going to be much higher than the king and higher than Galadriel and anything that she wants, right? So again, well played Sauron. Annoying. It's annoying because again, knowing where it ends, it's very painful. But you know, as I said, you have to respect the game. <laughs> you got to respect it. He's doing a really good job. So yeah, he's got that. And of course they need more mithril and we see that, um, you know, Sauron let him know that don't worry about the mithril issue. I've got that under control as well. So obviously he caused whatever happened at the mountain at khazad Yeah, he caused whatever happened there because he knows that he has to get the desperate, he has to get the dwarves into a place where they're so desperate that they will do whatever they have to, to take care of their own, such as give up the mithril. Plus, of course, there was rings for the dwarfs too, right? Yeah, so yeah, he needs everybody to have a ring is the bottom line. Just like Elrond says, he's gonna want every race to have these rings so that he can in use them to influence them and bend their will. Because as Elrond said beautifully, oh no, this is Galadriel actually. She's like, he doesn't want to conquer like he doesn't want to fight to get control of Middle Earth. He wants to bend Middle Earth to his will. It's more than that. And it just shows you how diabolical Sauron is. Cause yeah, he could, 
effectively get an orc army big enough to like subdue everybody by force, but that's, he knows that in time there'll be revolutions that people won't really respect or, or do what he wants. Like he wants their minds. He wants to have them as his own little puppets that he can just make do whatever he wants. He doesn't want free will in this new world. He wants to be the supreme leader and he wants to be the only one with free will, right? And this is one of the reasons why Adar wanted him dead. So anyway, that's kind of what he's got in motion. And now that he's got Celebrimbor, as I've already said, he's already getting this plan well into motion. So whew, good episode, guys. I thought that was really, really good. I like how they're showing all the puzzle pieces slowly starting to form that picture. And uh, yeah, as usual, just well done. I enjoyed it. So I hope you guys enjoyed watching along with me. If you did, please show some love and I will see you in the next one.